Hi, welcome to Chemistry 3007. Uh, we're going to talk about another property of the anti-symmetrizer. We, in the last little mini lecture, we saw that um, the square of the anti-symmetrizer was an anti-symmetrizer, except for a factor. Now, we're going to use that result to start calculating matrix elements of a Hamiltonian. So let's look at this theorem. If we have a, a determinant wave function, psi, which is an anti-symmetrizer acting on a product Hartree wave function, so I'm going to use phi, this is a product of individual orbitals which have been anti-symmetrized. So it's phi here is a determinant wave function, a potential Hartree Fock wave function. What are its matrix elements like? Well, the matrix elements look like this, the integral of psi h psi. And these are anti-symmetrized anti products. So we have here an anti-symmetrizer times a product and an anti-symmetrizer times a Hartree product. Wow, we have n factorial terms in here. We have n factorial terms in here. So this is essentially a square of an anti-symmetrizer. And the theorem says that, that we're going to prove this quantity in here is equal to this last equality. We can essentially get rid of one of the anti-symmetrizers on the left-hand side, leaving the anti-symmetrizer only on the right-hand side, except for a missing factor. In other words, when we evaluate matrix elements between determinants, we only need to consider the effects of the permutations on one side of the matrix element, in this case, the right-hand side. And you can probably guess that it's because a squared equals a, which we proved in the last lecture. And you would be right. So let's see how that works. Here's the proof. Let's go. We're going to do the proof in stages. So the first thing to note is let's consider one permutation, just one acting on phi. And on the right-hand side, we have a determinant wave function. So here's one permutation, p phi. Uh, integrating with all permutations on the right-hand side with the psi. Okay, how do we do that? Let's first get rid of the p on the left-hand side. Let's do an inverse permutation on the left and the right. So this would maybe permute 1 and 2 on the left-hand side. Let's undo that permutation. Let's swap 1 and 2 back. But if we swap 1 and 2 back on the left-hand side, we have to do it on the right-hand side as well. So we do p to the minus 1 on both sides. The p to the minus 1, the reverse permutation, gets rid of the permutation on the left-hand side. So the p to the minus 1, the reverse permutation, uh, acts on the right-hand side only. Actually, the reverse of the permutation is itself. If you do that permutation and you do it again, uh, you will undo that permutation. Or you can think of it as doing it in the opposite direction. Okay, so that was pretty easy. Um, let's keep going. Now, we've done it for one permutation. Um, let's now put in the whole sum of permutations. So here we had one permutation, and now we put in the whole sum of permutations times their um, uh, phase factor, their um, parity factor, as sometimes it's called. So we put that in, and we know now that if we have a permutation, we can swap that to the right-hand side. So the p to the u can come to the a right-hand side with a p to the minus 1. I'm labeling this permutation with u now because we are summing over all permutations. And by the way, we can also put this factor, which is just a real number, we can shift that to the right-hand side, and we can put the whole summation to the right-hand side. So this is no trouble. This is just uh, an application of the previous result. Now we're going to do something tricky. Um, it turns out that if we sum over all permutations, inverse permutations, times a phase factor, it's the same as doing a sum over all permutations, right? Because remember, a permutation and its reverse, they're nearly the same. So if we run over all inverse permutations, as we are doing in this summation here, it's the same as running over all normal permutations, PU. The only question is, what is the parity of p to the minus 1? 
It turns out that the parity of P to the minus 1 is the same as the parity of P to the U, because if we do a certain number of swaps one way, if it's even or odd, if we do the reverse permutation, same number of swaps in the reverse way, it, it's the same number of steps. It's either even or odd. So the parity of P to the minus 1 is equal to the parity of P. So this EU doesn't change. Fantastic. So we can actually swap this set of permutations from the left to the right. That's what we wanted to show in the second step. And now we're nearly there because this term on the left is except for a factor, an anti-symmetrizer. So here we go. We're now replacing everything on the left with an A. We can shift everything to the right now because of the previous result. And remember, there's an A in front of the psi. Um, psi is equal to an anti-symmetrizer times a product of orbitals. So that's actually A squared times the product of orbitals. And now we can use the result from the previous slide, which is A squared equals A except for a factor. And we get this. That's what we wanted to prove. Fantastic. So we've proved the result, which is if we want to do a matrix element with two anti-symmetrizers in, in there, we don't need to consider all n factorial terms squared. We only need to consider n factorial swaps on the right-hand side. That's really useful. But look, we still have n factorial terms to deal with, so it's not that easy. But wait, in the next lecture we'll show you uh, some applications of this. See you later.